many that we don't see. But uh, what is important here is that um, they are all connected to one single common ancestor, Luca, uh, like the name of uh, our magazine, Luca. So it is the last universal common ancestor. And uh, Charles Dar Darwin actually used this evolutionary theory to um, split life into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Bacteria and archaea are single-celled organisms uh, without um, a nucleus, whereas eukaryotes include us, plants, animals, uh, multicellular complex organisms. And before uh, DNA or gene technology was available, um, organisms uh, uh, were, were classified within this tree using um, their structure and physiology. But now with uh, new DNA, RNA, and protein similarities that we can, uh, that scientists can find, this tree of life has been expanded. This is a very complicated view, but what I want you to take away is the diversity. is the fact that uh, this, uh, th there are millions of species and life in, as we know it is very diverse. And that is important because if we are thinking of how to understand the origins of life or even to possibly create synthetic life, then we need to understand that there is this diversity uh, of life around us. And the first thing that we that scientists are trying to do when thinking of origin of life research and to recreate life is to see it in diverse idler life species and then a commonality. So what characteristics are common to all these um, orga uh, organisms and species? And um, so we need to start from somewhere, right? So it's not an exhaustive uh, list of characteristics that we want, but we want like simple, uh, simple characteristics that is common throughout this uh, uh, this tree of life or whatever species we see, you know, and that we can um, we can uh, um, dot it down to three components, and this is something that scientists agree on that we can we can bring it down to compartmentalization, to information processing, metabolism, growth and movement and replication. And I'll explain each one of this. So if we consider compartmentalization, what I mean by that is that if you think of every cell, every cell is an individual compartment. So that means there is a physical barrier uh, that separates the cell from its surroundings and that keeps the chemical contents and all the biomolecules inside the cell from leaking out. And this is very important because if the, if it wasn't for this physical barrier, um, each cell would not be a separate entity, and all the reactions that goes on inside cells to keep us alive and do everything that we do wouldn't happen. So physical separation is very important um, to maintain its in, internal environment. Uh, the next thing is if you have a physical physically separated entity like this then this entity, like our cell, also needs to communicate with the surrounding. So it, it, in order to like, uh, in order to uh, do all the biochemical reactions that a cell does, it needs to take in nutrients, it needs to um, process those nutrients into chemicals inside the cell, and to build new components internally. So to do all this, it needs to be able to communicate within the cell, as well as outside the cell. So that is important. The, the communication between the external environment and internal environment is important to do all the reactions that can maintain cells and eventually help it grow. And of course, we cannot say something is alive, or let's say we all agree that being able to reproduce or make copies of yourself is a very important uh, part of being alive, right? So if you can't move, uh, take in uh, nutrients, grow, and eventually replicate, then you don't survive. You cease to survive if you don't replicate, and therefore to make copies of yourself is very important. So we have at least now tried to understand like what, how we can like, um, how we can um, simplify, let's say, the main aspects of life. But now I wanted to like bring in uh, an interesting question is, Okay, we define that all these characteristics um, 
can if we bring in all these characteristics, we can say that we are alive. But like, would you consider then viruses to be alive? Because um, we know that viruses can create havoc in everybody's lives, and we know what has been going on with COVID and everything. But then, do our viruses alive? So biologists generally agree that viruses are not alive because they don't, they cannot replicate, they cannot self-replicate. So they cannot reproduce without the help of a host. So, but some others will say that it has a genetic material, so it should be considered alive. But what I want to say with this is that it's not, it, the, the important part is not to really draw a line where to say that, okay, this, this is where we draw the line of being alive or not alive. That's not the point. And it's not, um, and that line would actually depend on who is researching the, the work. So whether it is a chemist, a biologist, a geologist. So all these people will have different, um, uh, different points where they draw lines. So um, that is not what is, that is not what is important in origin of life research, and it's not necessary to do this research. So that is what I want to say here, that a clear line is not necessary to perform origin of life research. Now, moving on, we, um, we saw that there are these aspects that are essential to life, but we also know that a lot of molecules are essential to keeping us alive. And we can, uh, we can separate them as proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids or fats. Now, proteins carry out so many functions in our bodies, right? Like they catalyze metabolic reactions. Uh, proteins also give um, structure to cells. So like what you see in green here are actually protein filaments that are part of the cytoskeleton, which give uh, cells its shape. So it's maintaining the shape of the cells. So it gives structure to cells and it it, uh, a lot of essential chemical reactions are uh, due to proteins. And proteins are made up of amino, acid, amino groups, carboxylic acid groups, and this is one uh, amino acid group. And when, there are, when you have multiple number of these amino acid groups linked together, then you get a protein. So that is what a protein molecule is. Um, now, uh, nucleic acids. We know nucleic acids uh, are the primary information carrying molecules in all living things, right? Like, so we have uh, RNA and DNA, which are the two main types of nucleic acids, and they carry all the genetic information. And it is this genetic information that is then used to make proteins in our cells. So we know the central dogma of life, right? transcription, translation. So um, now these nuclei, um, Nucleic acids are like like amino acids are uh, make proteins. Nucleotides make nucleic acids. So uh, you have so the, uh, you have like phosphate groups, sugar groups, and amino groups that form the nitrogenous base that then makes nucleic acids. So I'm talking about all these individual chemical groups because these are important when you think of origin of life research as to what molecules you want to try to produce in the lab. So that's why I'm highlighting what each um, molecule is made of. Um, next is lipids, right? So um, we know that lipids, triglycerides, uh, we've heard of, heard of it a lot uh, in our daily life about good fats, bad fats. So they are, they are energy storage in our body. Um, but we also have other kinds of lipids called phospholipids or cholesterol, and these are what forms the cell membrane. So I talked about uh, the compartments, right? So, so cells, the, uh, the physical barrier of the cells in our bodies are made of phospholipids and cholesterol. And that's why these are also important molecules uh, that uh, we need to consider when, you think, when we think of origin of life research. So, uh, so I, I told you about uh, aspects that can that we can consider when we want to say something is alive, and also about molecules uh, that are critical to uh, life. Um, so, but I but I do want to say like so now I want to say what is I mean what, what is origin of life research? So we know all this, but then where are we going from there, right? So. I know the slide is a bit heavy, but what I want you to really just understand or take away from the slide 
is that origin of life research is when we to understand the transition from chemistry to biology. So really to understand how chemistry became biology. We know that um, Earth is uh, around approximately 4.5 billion years old and that life on Earth, so like the single celled organisms started uh, or there, there is proof that we can see the existence of single celled organisms on Earth approximately three to two billion years ago. But it's really, again, like I said, it's difficult to pinpoint like which point do we say that there is a live, uh, a, a live cell or an inanimate cell. So, um, so in the lab, what scientists are trying to do or the current origin of life research that is being done is to really see how simple molecules, which could have existed in um, prebiotic Earth, so Earth where there was no life, transitioned into some a bit more complex molecules, then building biological building blocks like nucleic acids, um, lipids, and proteins, which could have then formed like a simple version of the cell that we have now. So that could have been bacteria or something even simpler than bacteria or RKA. Uh, and eventually how all this became complex multicellular organisms that we see now. So this is really what you should understand when you think of origin of life research, how simple chemistry became complex building blocks and complex life forms. And so for the, for the purpose of today's talk, I thought of like um, segregating the talk into these two parts. So what you see here is like what I told you, the prebiotic life research. So you, you, what uh, what scientists do is to emulate or, or to like um, recreate the conditions that was there on early Earth, you know, through different hypotheses and see if they can form proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. And the other side of the research, or other, um, part of the research, is to see if we can make. Uh, artificial constructs, so constructs like droplets, like um, like the membrane uh, aggregates with membranes. I'll talk about all this later, but just to give you an idea of where we are going, uh, of these lifelike constructs that can have functionalities. And eventually the grand idea would be to combine these constructs with these chemical reactions and see if life emerges on its own. So the idea would be then to like merge these two lines and see what happens. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I thought it's nice to separate them and talk about them individually. So it's a bit easier to explain. OK, so I will talk about uh, this part first. So prebiotic life research. I will talk about two main theories, the RNA world theory and lipid theory. Um, so RNA world theory suggests that life began with the with the occurrence with with the emergence of RNA molecules, um, and the, and scientists believe that because of the importance of RNA in the synthesis of proteins and how proteins are very essential to human uh, to life. So we know that RNA directs the synthesis of proteins in ribosomes, right? So RNA takes information from DNA. And um, in the ribosome, it catalyzes the reaction to produce amino acids that then produces proteins. So DNA, you get information from DNA and RNA produces, uh, catalyzes production of proteins. So this is, so th that is why, because of this crucial role of RNA in keeping us alive, scientists thought that, um, that RNA could be the first molecule that emerged on Earth. And that really became stronger when scientists understood that RNA can catalyze its own formation. So not only can it transmit information through the um, through this uh, transcription translation, but it can also catalyze its own formation. And um, there are multiple theories, but most, let's say, like two main theories that I would like to talk about here is that um, so, uh, there are some um, researchers who believe that in these hydrothermal vents, so they're like vents on the ocean floor on very young Earth, so many billions of years ago, that um, 
there these nucleobases or the units that form nucleic acids and DNA and RNA could have been formed in these vents because of the high pressure and high temperature and the extreme conditions there. Um, and with the primary molecules that existed on early Earth, such as uh, carbon dioxide, water, um, uh, sulfur, etc. And there is another line of research where scientists believe that um, so there is there is proof now to say that in early Earth there is there was a period when Earth was bombarded by meteoroids and ast asteroids. So um, scientists believe that at that point these meteoroids and asteroids also could have bought other chemicals, so from outside Earth, and these chemicals could have led to the formation of nucleobases. So these are two of the uh, theories which say that RNA could have formed um, through hydrothermal vents or meteoroids and asteroids that are brought from outside of um, outside of Earth. But the downside of this theory is that it's also not very um, okay. So RNA. So let's say that we form the first RNA molecule, right? But then it also needs to make more RNA molecules. Uh, so the scientists still haven't understood how RNA can replicate itself after the formation. So that is somewhere that is that is an area of research that's still undergoing. So there has been new research where scientists have been able to make RNA molecules from simple molecules, but not to make them repl self-replicating. So that is the bottleneck right now. Now the second theory that I would like to talk about is the metabolism first theory. So um, here scientists believe that RNA is a very complex molecule and it couldn't have formed from very simple molecules. So they say that probably it was simpler okay, molecules yeah. that before RNA, um, such as lipids. And lipids, like I told you, uh, are um, very essential to life as well. And that's why some scientists um, want to work on the theory that lipids could have formed first on Earth. And um, they say that if we think of such a lipid, what you see here in a circle could be uh, a membrane that is formed by lipids. And that could be semi-permeable, which means that it could let in nutrients and let out waste, which is very important to keep yourself alive, right? So for metabolism, you need to let in nutrients and let out waste, and that is possible through a lipid membrane. Uh, but what they also say is that these lipid membranes can keep themselves alive and reproduce if there was a chemical reaction going on inside. So I will talk about some works where this is this was um, shown. But yeah, so that's the idea here. The idea is that we start with simpler molecules like lipids, which uh, which could have been more easily formed on early Earth when compared to RNA. So, um, so I talked about this, where um, scientists are looking at conditions in uh, early Earth, like hydrothermal vents, ponds, uh, asteroids and meteorites that hit the Earth, to, to see that if uh, RNA was formed first or lipids were formed first. But the idea is eventually to see if we can go from prebiotic conditions to simple molecules such as proteins, nucleus, and lipids. Uh, now I'll talk talk to you about a different line of research where researchers, including me, are trying to see if we can make uh, the or if we can engineer or create artificial compartments that can be combined with chemical reactions that we see here to, to um, recreate some lifelike properties. Um, and among the compartments that is used widely are micelles, vesicles, and droplets. And I'll explain each one of them. So what you see here is a lipid molecule, like the one we saw before, like triglycerides or like phospholipids. They are lipid molecules uh, that eventually aggregate and form small compartments. So what you see here are, the in, re in reality, they're nanometer size, so like 10 power 9. So very small, smaller, thinner than your the diameter of your hair so you can't see it with visible light so that the idea is that you make compartments with these surfactants that can then uh, do whatever reactions you wanted to do or 
these monomers, uh, these surfactants can also form vesicles. So, and this bilayer is very similar to the bilayer of cells. So it's two layers of surfactants that uh, come together to form a sphere. And we use vesicles because it's very similar to cell membranes. So that is a good starting point uh, if we want to think of a compartment, right? And thirdly, you also use um, water and oil. So droplets, just like just like when you add oil and water and you mix and you, you see a lot of oil droplets and water, it's the same but smaller. And the idea behind using these oil water uh, emulsions is that there are also studies or theories which say that um, in early Earth, there could have been oil layers on water that could have then uh, been a place where life would have emerged. Uh, so in that case, you um, you would you would need oil and water, and that and in in these studies, this is the compartment. So we have really small nanometer sized compartments. We have larger vesicles, which are similar to cells, and then we have emulsion, so oil and water mixed together to form separate phases. And the idea is that these are all compartments, right? So we can put whatever we want inside these compartments and they will stay there. And if there are chemical and if there are chemicals that can react together, then they do that reaction. So that's the idea of using all these compartments. Um, so I just wanted to get a bit more into uh, phospholipids because uh, I just thought it's nicer to understand the rest of it. So like I said, uh, the phospholipid is like what we have in our body as well. Uh, they're fats. So they have a water. So the one part of their molecule, it loves water. So it's water soluble. The other part is not water soluble. So uh, it's oil soluble. And this is what gives it a surfactant property. So in our everyday life, like the soap that we use are made up of surfactants. Uh, or uh, hand wash everything, or the, the 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 soap that we use to clean our clothes. Everything is made of molecules which are similar to this, which have a hydrophilic, water loving part and a water hating part. And if we put these molecules in water, they will align together because they want they like each other better than they like water. So, and it is this property that makes them form different compartments. So, like I said, they can form micelles, uh, which are nanometer in size. They can form vesicles, which are bigger and bilayers. And they can also form flat bilayers. So, there are different right conditions under which this can form. But basically, these aggregates are versatile in the sense we can form different compartments uh, with these, uh, with these uh, lipids or fats. Okay, so um, one uh, one, kind, one stream of work that I wanted to talk to you about synthesizing lipids so that we can have these micellar compartments is where you take um, an a thiol, which is a oil soluble chemical, you combine it with a water soluble chemical. So this this component is actually part of the lipid that forms our cell membrane. So this is very relevant to um, let's say like biological conditions as well. And if you make it react, then it forms a lipid, aggregates and forms these micelles. And that is what you see here. Small dots here are these micelles that you form from these reactions. So then we know that, okay, we can have like simple chemical, simple chemicals that can be put together and we can form these micelles. So that is what the idea of this line of research is, is that we can form these from simple precursors. And that is possible. We have seen that. Now, what if now that we have these simple micelles, we also want them to grow and divide, right? Because that is also one property that we think is essential, that we've agreed is essential to life. So scientists have also shown that you can have these micelles and by having chemical reactions inside them, they can grow and eventually they can split and form two copies of itself. And if we keep if we keep the chemical reactions running, they can further evolve into forming vesicles. So they go from micelles to vesicles. Um, 
And there's been a lot of work also to see um, the division of vesicles. So it's the same, but the idea is that you have like smaller vesicles, which then grow and then split. And here also you have two vesicles that grows and then splits into two. So these are all very interesting because what now we can do is we can have a compartment, a vesicle, we can add um, a molecule that can uh, transmit information like an RNA or DNA molecule. And this vesicle can grow on its own and split. So it can make copies of itself. So here we already have a compartment that we can combine with our RNA or any other molecule that has that can store and transmit genetic information. Now I want to um, show you something a bit different. So we talked about compartments and how they can grow and divide right by themselves. But what is also interesting is if these compartments can move on the zone, move on their own, because we know, right, if any like primitive cell that would have formed on early Earth, they would have had to move to get nutrients, move towards light, towards um, better um, like uh, pH or other chemical conditions that is favorable to them. So we know that move, the ability to move on their own is important to microorganisms like what you see here. So this is a sperm cell that is moving um, on its own. So it's moving by just the tail beating up and down, right? So that, that's, that's what is keeping it moving. And movement of organisms is important not only for microorganisms, but also in our body where if we have a wound, then we have these cells moving towards the wound area to heal our um, wound, right? So that, that is, so, so movement is important. And what you see here is, is a sperm cell, like I said, and the size is around 10 micrometer. And this is a work that we worked on, uh, I worked on during my PhD, where we had oil droplets. That's what you see here as um, black. And this is all just water outside. And you see that it's moving on its own. So we shine light. Uh, so we radiate our oil droplets with light and it moves on its own. And what I want you to take away from here is that we are able to make a very simple thing such as an oil droplet move on its own. And th the dimensions are comparable. So we are able to make something really small, only 10 times bigger than a sperm cell to move on its own. Which means that, again, these compartments can be used to combine chemical reactions and then move on its own. So that is what I want you to take away from the slide, that the, that the ability to create movement uh, in very simple things such as oil droplets and the ability that they can move on their own without any external energy given to them. Now, the, 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 uh, so now I, what I want to show you is how we can combine all this. So I talked to you about droplets, about vesicles, about uh, chemical reactions that form RNA lipids. So what researchers are trying to do now is to combine all this. So here, what, they, what these researchers have shown is that they can combine lipids or fats and oil droplets. And they can, so first they have only vesicles. When they change the temperature, they go from vesicles to droplets, oil droplets. And when they reduce the temperature cool, then they go from oil droplet to vesicles as well. So they're showing that depending on temperature changes, they can go from vesicles to oil droplets. And temperature is relevant here because in early Earth, there were harsh conditions where there were wet and dry cycles. So the, the temperature, there were like drastic changes in temperature, like you see here. So such such differences in temperature is actually relevant for origin of life research. And, and what we see here is that we can combine what we know with different components and see how they all fit together. And this is another work which I did during my PhD as well, where we combined a reaction uh, which forms a phospholipid or a fat molecule with droplets and saw that we can make the droplets move move by themselves. So again, we're combining different parts of this origin of life research to put them together and to see how we can build more complex systems that can resemble um, living organisms or microorganisms. Um, now, what I wanted to, I, I want to end by saying that 
in all these things that I talked to you about, whether it's things moving on their own or these compartments, they're important not only for origin of life research, but they're also important uh, in other areas where there are more applications. So there's a lot of research going on in making small micrometer or nanometer sized objects move which are powered by enzymes. So we know enzymes is very biologically relevant. So um, these enzymes can be used to move things, move small objects um, in a very predictable manner like we want them to. And that is important because we can use these micrometer objects that move on their own for uh, drug delivery applications. So it's something that we can guide these micrometer, nanometer objects into our body to, to uh, make them go to a place we want to and then deliver drugs. So these micro machines or artificial machines have not only um, relevance in origin of life research, but also in applications where there's drug delivery, where um, um, and so on. And also in, in making, so what you see here, is is a small robot that is walking on its own. So also to make devices such as such as these micro robots that are more intelligent and smarter than the ones we have. So uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say here. So it's not only for origin of life research, but it's also to build artificial machines that are smart and can uh, have applications in the real world uh, now. Okay, so I want to wrap up now, but I really just would like uh, to tell you that these are the things that I would like you to take away from this, that origin of life research is to study the transition from chemistry to biology. And the effort is to really build systems um, that from simple molecules that can have lifelike properties, whether it is growth, whether it is movement, whether it is replication. Uh, we can never like, build a grand um, it, it, it's it's too ambitious to think of one grand system that can do all of this but the idea is to like pick one property and see if we can build that with simple molecules and eventually the hope is that all this comes together and we will have a better understanding of how to create life and yeah thank you <laughs>